Nursing and Midwifery Officer of Australia. And uh, we have uh, an important milestone in relation to uh, the COVID-19 vaccine rollout. Uh, 23 million doses have now been delivered and uh, 276,000 yesterday. We'll come to that in a minute. But uh, there is a significant announcement uh, in relation to $472 million for over 290 projects for the National Health and Medical Research Council grants programs. Um, these grants are about long-term research, about changing lives, but also about rapidly moving uh, to meet specific needs. The largest area of grants is uh, infectious diseases, including uh, COVID-19 and coronavirus more generally with $84 million. Uh, there is uh, uh, over $79 million of grants for cancer. Uh, we have uh, very significantly $50 million for cardiovascular disease and $49 million for mental health. And every state and territory has received uh, uh, awards based on uh, an independent uh, uh, peer-reviewed program and process uh, and wonderful projects. The Doherty Institute uh, and the University of Melbourne together, uh, $1.5 million to focus on uh, coronavirus and flu vaccines and advancing and bringing forward new technologies. Uh, we have uh, the University of Western Australia with over a million dollars to focus on children's respiratory vaccines, in particular cystic fibrosis. Uh, childhood concussion through sport, this is a real personal passion over $3 million for the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. And then uh, very significantly, uh, as an example, um, the Menzies uh, Research Institute in uh, the Northern Territory, uh, over $600,000 to focus on improving uh, cancer outcomes for Indigenous women with a particular focus uh, on gynaecological cancers. So these are just fundamentally important programs uh, the University of Queensland, a million dollars to focus uh, on uh, new models of mental health care for young Indigenous Australians. And literally, virtually every field in, in medicine um, is covered. Uh, it's just a tribute to the Australian researchers and to be able to support this, in addition to what we're doing with the over $600 million a year uh, for the Medical Research Future Fund, is to see research driving solutions to problems in Australia. Uh, in relation to uh, COVID-19 and the vaccine rollout, um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, 23 million doses have now been delivered in Australia, but we're moving to an additional channel, and that is workplace vaccination. So today, Operation COVID Shield has opened up workplace vaccinations through what's called a request for tender, a, a request for applications, and uh, that will now be open on a uh, continuous basis from now until December, and uh, it's looking to have the first of those vaccinations occur in the coming weeks uh, in the first half of October. And so this is an important step forward. It's uh, a request inviting applications, and uh, Operation COVID Shield will uh, move continuous continuously through assessing those and commencing in the coming weeks. Uh, in terms of the rollout, uh, importantly, we've had uh, 276,000 vaccinations in uh, the last 24 hours. That's an increase of 17,000 on last Monday. So in one week, day-to-day, uh, -day, an increase of 17,000. And so very important momentum. Over 7.4 million vaccinations in uh, the last uh, 24 day, uh, in the last 28 days, over 7.4 million vaccinations in the last 28 days. Uh, very significantly, uh, in, and in many ways, one of the most important figures is we've reached 68.5% of first doses of more than 14.1 million Australians who've come forward to be vaccinated. What that means is there's less than 400,000 Australians who need to come forward this week to put us beyond the 70% first dose rate. And we know that uh, second doses follow the first doses. And so that's an, in, an incredibly important milestone. Less than 400,000 Australians needed to reach 
the 70% first dose mark. And uh, our hope and our expectation is that uh, we'll do that by Saturday, if not earlier. So a critical thing, but to all those Australians, the doses are coming in. We're seeing uh, the arrival of additional doses. Another uh, shipment uh, has arrived overnight from the UK. All of these are coming together and uh, they're being distributed and that's about saving lives and protecting lives. One of the critical things that's uh, happened is that uh, we have now opened the 12 to 15 year old uh, age group and uh, I understand there's some very good news on that front. So on that, I'll turn to uh, Professor Alison McMillan, the Chief Nursing and Midwifery Officer for Australia. Uh, thank you, Minister. So yes, as the Minister said, as of yesterday, 12 to 15 year olds are eligible for vaccination, uh, Pfizer and Moderna, so they can start booking um, their, uh, their appointments now, which is, of course, uh, I think very encouraging, particularly for parents concerned about their children. Um, alone yesterday, 12,000 doses were administered to the 12 to 15 year olds, and we know that uh, 59,000 have been administered now um, to 12 to 15 year olds across the country. As we um, as we're seeing, as we call it, the epidemiological curve shift, we know that uh, a large proportion of our older uh, generations like myself now have had two doses. We're actually seeing the cases increasingly in the younger age groups, um, and this brings into, uh, into that then the, um, the 12 to 15 year olds now, as I say, eligible um, to book here. Um, it is, of course, the, the parents who need to make that booking on behalf of the children, um, and we encourage them to uh, do that as soon as possible. So, thank you, Minister. Thanks very much uh, to uh, Alison. Happy to take questions. If I can start with uh, Dan, please. Uh, Minister, just a question about the announcement today from the ACT government about the lockdown here in, in Canberra. So, the decision has been made to extend that for another four weeks. So what was initially a, a seven day lockdown will now extend beyond eight. Given the high rates of vaccination here in the ACT, do you think the ACT government has struck the right balance between meeting public health objectives and also balancing that with mental health considerations, community wellbeing and, and economic imperatives? It is a difficult day for people in the ACT. Um, I know how hard these lockdowns are and uh, particularly for families with children, but really for everybody. And uh, so uh, we would urge people to take up uh, the head to health opportunities or the Beyond Blue coronavirus uh, hotline opportunities that are there. Um, we have uh, recently provided additional support in Victoria and um, we'd be very uh, willing to work with the ACT government, indeed keen to work with the ACT government on additional support for the ACT. I respect completely the decision of the ACT. Um, their vaccination rate is now uh, well into the uh, into the mid 70s and, and increasing at a very rapid pace. It's continued right through the 60% and 70% uh, range um, at a, a fast pace. And so that will provide protection. What it will mean is that they'll reach the um, 70 and 80% double dose rates um, in uh, a relatively short period. So it's a difficult decision. We do respect it um, and we'd urge everybody, if they, if they do have challenges, to seek help for themselves or their family through uh, Beyond Blue, Headspace, head to, uh, head to Health or other forms of mental health support. Hey, uh, Jane? Um, question to you both, if I may, just broadly on, the, on rapid testing. Uh, I know there's been some advice that's gone out, I think, in the last week from the TGA to businesses on, on how to implement rapid testing. Um, it's formed such a big part of the, of the sort of path out of lockdowns in Europe in particular. Um, where are we at on that now? And what is the advice uh, to the AHPBC that you're giving on things like uh, on rapid testing? And what, what role do you see that playing, I guess, at the 70 and at the 80 percent intervals? Sure. Uh, so look, I'll start briefly and then uh, um, uh, Alison may wish to add something. Uh, we now have 28 uh, rapid antigen tests uh, approved in Australia on my latest advice. Um, rapid antigen testing uh, will play a big part in uh, Australia's uh, pathway out of lockdown. And so I have asked the TGA uh, to rapidly consider the role of uh, antigen tests or rapid antigen tests and uh, they will be going through that process. Um, they are already uh, 
assessing and approving uh, the rapid antigen tests themselves. And now um, on the basis of uh, their medical advice, I'm hopeful that these tests will be available um, at the earliest possible time for workplaces. And then subsequently, uh, once we have the uh, support of AHPPC uh, uh, within the home, but rapid antigen tests will be available in workplaces and soon enough in the home environment. Alison? Uh, thanks, Minister. Yes, um, just to add to that, um, certainly we know and have relied here on what we call the gold standard, as you know, the, the PCA testing. Rapid, rapid antigen testing is, a, is an addition or an adjunct to that. Um, and we know that we will continue to rely on PCR as our mainstay of testing. Importantly, I think one of the things that we're doing, and we're certainly trialling it in aged care at the moment, is um, it's as much about what do you do when you get a positive and what are the actions that are taken then to address that through PCR, to make sure those pathways are safe and that we're not um, causing any harm as a result of that. Uh, and so both the tests to make sure that they reach this, the requirements of the TGA and their um, reliability, and then how you actually use them, whether it's in aged care or other workplaces, to ensure that then you can prevent any further transmission. So that's the work that's underway. Um, and as Minister says, we will expect to see it increasingly uh, used across the community in, in the coming months. Sarah? Starting on WA, Minister, um, today WA announced that it's going to open up Pfizer jabs for over 60s. It follows the Northern Territory and South Australia doing this. Do you welcome that or do you have any concerns about it sending a message sort of if you if you just wait, you can have a different, a different jab? And are there any concerns about AstraZeneca doses going to waste now that Pfizer is being made available to, to some of those older age groups as well? Uh, no, I uh, welcome each state as they feel that they're in a position to ensure that uh, everybody who does require a Pfizer in the under 60 age group can access that Pfizer. That's the very important thing. Our job is to ensure that uh, no person uh, between 12 and uh, 59 is denied a vaccine um, because we want to make sure that they have access to that. And if those states believe in their state system that they have that uh, capacity, then that's entirely reasonable. Uh, we keep it under constant review um, around the country. We do know that uh, in some other parts of the country there remains very high demand and um, the, uh, for the uh, mRNA vaccines from those that are under 59, so we want to make sure that they have that. I would note uh, that uh, what we've uh, done is uh, seen now well over 90% uh, of uh, over 70s uh, have uh, uh, had their first vaccine, their first dose. So over 90% of over 70s have uh, had a first dose. Uh, that's been overwhelmingly driven by AstraZeneca. Uh, we've passed six and a half million uh, Australians who've had AstraZeneca. Uh, we're now at well over 10 and a half million total doses. And so um, all of the vaccines are good. All of the vaccines uh, protect you and all of the vaccines save lives. And if I may, I'll go to uh, Rachel. Thanks, Minister. A couple of related questions, if I can. Uh, what has the response been to the Prime Minister's calls for states and territories to come up with a plan for home quarantine? Are they likely to use the same app that SA is currently trialling? And how quickly would you like to see those home quarantine plans in place? So the first thing is we're all very familiar with home quarantine. Um, I have to say you're in the ACT now, and I have done home quarantine twice there, and it was an outstanding model. Uh, I was receiving texts daily, uh, random uh, uh, visits uh, from the police to the door to check that uh, you know whoever was in home quarantine was there, in my case, uh, me. That, I think, was an absolute gold standard. I, I haven't experienced uh, uh, that in other states and territories. Um, other than Victoria, of course, but uh, that's an example that we know how to do home quarantine and do it well. And uh, Rachel Stephen Smith and uh, Andrew Barr have, uh, have shown us the way. Uh, the second thing is AHPPC, and Alison might address this, will be looking uh, and are in fact in ongoing assessment of home quarantine standards. And I think we're seeing um, through what we've done domestically a pathway for that action internationally. Uh, Alison? Uh, yes, uh, as the Minister said, uh, HPPC, we continue to look at um, the, the variable options of, of quarantine and 
I too have um, done home quarantine. Um, we just need to look at uh, how we keep ourselves safe and keep those in home quarantine safe. And uh, what we will see, I think, in the coming times is, is a, a move towards that. Um, and we know that some jurisdictions have done it solely um, for domestic um, home quarantine between states. Um, and we may see it, I think, um, moving into the international market into the future. Will you be looking at things like the app being trialled in South Australia for a more broad application in that instance? Yes, I think technology will be an important part. Um, the resource amount, the amount of work required um, to maintain home quarantine, uh, I like, as I say, the Minister did home quarantine here in ACT, visited every day by police. That's a lot of resource. If we can find ways to effectively do that um, through an app, and I think there are a number of them that are a potential to be used, um, they use geof, um, uh, place um, checking where you, the way you actually are, um, then yes, I think we'll see the increased use of technology, as we've seen with um, things like the COVID app and the um, check-ins. So I, I just add that the uh, South Australian uh, home quarantine app is a real breakthrough and it does provide a pathway forwards. Now, um, if I can go uh, please to uh, uh, to uh, Shuba. Thanks, Minister. Um, can you just give us a bit more detail on how the business vaccination program will actually work? Will there be any cost to the business or employees and what kind of businesses can actually take part? Like, will there be any limit on the size of the business or the employee number? Uh, so the, uh, the the details are being provided by Operation COVID Shield, uh, but essentially what we're looking for is uh, uh, businesses that are seeking to vaccinate uh, their workforce uh, either on their premises or in a, another central point uh, to do it in a COVID safe way, um, in a way which is going to ensure that we lift the ultimate number of uh, uh, the ultimate number of, uh, of jabs that are given, and uh, in particular uh, there's. Uh, no cost. Um, it'll be up to businesses to show that they can do it, but uh, we'll be providing the vaccines and they'll be working to ensure that the uh, vaccination providers are put there so it's free to all employees. One of the rules is, in fact, that wherever you are in Australia, if you are um, receiving a vaccine, it should come at no cost to you. And indeed, it's uh, not allowed for a fee to be levied for uh, any person to receive their COVID jab. So, whether, uh, whether you're in a, a Meatworks, whether you're in a Bunnings, whether you are um, in a restaurant um, or you're in a distribution warehouse, this is something that can make it easier to get the jab. Uh, Andrew. Uh, Minister, and I've got also a question for the Professor as well. Uh, Crown Resorts says it wants to mandate vaccinations for its staff and also for its visitors. I'm noting that the government doesn't uh, support mandatory, a broad mandatory vaccination policy. Would you at least encourage other public facing companies to pursue such a policy? And on a related subject, given that Crown Resorts uh, Professor is pursuing mandatory vaccinations, as a health professional, are you surprised that some states and territories are dragging their heels when it comes to mandating vaccinations? for health workers, uh, hospitals, whether it's cleaners or doctors or whatever, given that that seems to be eminent common sense? So just in terms of Crown, um, we are not mandating, um, other than in the uh, circumstance of uh, exceptional cases such as the protection of residents in, in aged care. Uh, but it is a matter for them um, as to whether or not they wish to apply it to their workforce uh, or their clientele. Um, Alison? So, Andrew, um, firstly, we do know that health professionals are, are taking up the vaccine in, in huge numbers. We know that they know it, how important it is for them, their patients and their families. We are seeing some jurisdictions have already mandated, and I think we will see other jurisdictions follow suit very, very quickly. Um, we've, uh, in some ways, perhaps we've, we've seen the success in HK. And we can learn all, a lot of lessons from what we've achieved in aged care. At now, I think 92% of aged care workers have had their first dose, which is, you know, a real credit to our aged care workers. And now it's our healthcare workers. But so can I press you on that because there are some jurisdictions that cite, for example, human human rights legislation for not pursuing mandatory uh, vaccinations when it only takes one person to have COVID for a whole hospital to be in lockdown. 
I, I think that our, my position is we, we are strongly encouraging. Ultimately, those jurisdictions need to make the choices themselves about what means or mechanism through a legislation they might choose to mandate. Certainly, we've made access to the vaccine available to all healthcare workers for quite some significant time now. Um, my position is that we continue to strongly encourage, but how a jurisdiction ultimately chooses to do that is up to them. Um, and uh, uh, all I can say is I really do strongly encourage all healthcare workers to do it as soon as they can if they haven't. And that includes the important people that support the clinical staff. Um, all of those are just as important to delivering healthcare across the system. The other thing probably, Andrew, just to let you know, is we've continued to review and look at the, um, the policies around how frequently you furlough staff um, in what is now a highly vaccinated population. So we're constantly adapting our frameworks and policies, and that includes learning, particularly from our colleagues in Victoria, about how you can safely manage furloughed staff, protecting staff and patients, but also being able to maintain services, critical services to the community. Arkham. Uh, yes, Ms. Can I just ask about the digital border declaration pass? Is that uh, going to be primarily for international arrivals or will it be rolled um, for state, international, uh, state border travel as well? Uh, no, this is uh, primarily focused on international arrivals, but we want to see Australians be able to travel overseas at the earliest possible time. And uh, all of these steps that we're taking uh, in terms of vaccinations, of driving to the 70 and the 80 percent mark, uh, of ensuring that uh, there's the uh, digital vaccination uh, certificate uh, that's available, uh, the uh, capacity to have uh, the effectively the digital arrivals card. These things bring Australians closer to travelling and reuniting with their loved ones. Uh, um, yeah, Ms. Minister, can I just ask you um, just a couple of quick questions. Picking up on mandatory vaccination, there is concern from the hospitality sector that once public health orders fall away, they'll be the target of legal action from anti-vaxxers who don't want to um, have to get vaccinated to enter the premises. Is it inevitable, even though those protections exist for them under property law, that we will see test cases taken to court where these private businesses are bearing the burden of what is strongly encouraged by medical professionals and the government. And just if I may pick up on what Dan asked about the ACT, if you have a population that is well over 70% first dose vaccinated, including the, if you take into account 12 to 15 year olds, and they're only experiencing 20 odd cases a day, and you say that you are respecting completely the decision to in no way indicate a reopening at 70 and even 80% vaccination. What message does that send to the rest of the country that isn't in as good a position as that? Well, the first thing is that we are absolutely committed to the national plan. And uh, my understanding is that all of the states and territories are committed to the national plan uh, with the 70% and 80% uh, double dose thresholds. And uh, the fact that the ACT does have such a high first dose rate uh, means that it is not too far away uh, from the 70 and 80 per cent second dose rate. So I'll, I'll let the ACT government speak to their decision. But I, I'd rather be upfront that we do respect uh, their decision and not to uh, engage in a debate. Um, and I think that is a very important part of the National Cabinet. They've committed to the national plan and we've committed to respecting um, their decisions en route to that. Uh, then in terms of uh, businesses such as hospitality and, and, and others, um, equally we've been very clear, as was the case with the uh, previous question, uh, that uh, we have in place a legal framework. It allows businesses to make their own decisions. We're not proposing to change that legal framework and they're able to make decisions in relation to the safety of their employees and they're able to make decisions in relation to the safety of their patrons and, and customers. So there's no proposed to uh, pr there's no proposal to change that on behalf of the uh, the government. So uh, with that, uh, what I want to do is uh, is finish by saying today we've passed 23 million vaccinations. Uh, we are at 68 and a half percent first doses, and less than 400,000 Australians from achieving that first 
major milestone of 70% whole of Australia first dose uh, a first dose rates. And so I urge everybody to keep coming forward. New vaccines are coming in. New bookings are opening up. Australians are coming forward uh, in record numbers. And I want to thank everybody, urge them to keep going and uh, say to our researchers, it's been a, an important day for you. Your research uh, will help save lives and protect lives. And uh, we have our vaccines because of international research uh, and we'll continue to play our part in uh, the search for vaccines, treatments, cures for not just COVID, but for all of the diseases. Thank you very much.